Hi fifth graders, we're here for chapter 19 of One Crazy Summer. So here's what we know so far from the last chapter. So the girls have arrived at the notion that this ideal, like, you know, like Disneyland, Tinkerbell kind of summer that they were hoping for in California, it's not going to happen. Um, but they want to try to make the best of it. We also know that Delphine and her sisters are pesting Cecile for the TV, but um, they got a radio then at the end of the last chapter. Um, because they enjoy watching shows and counting the different um, African-American characters and guests that they can see. And last, we also learned that Delphine presented the argument against the establishment, who was in this case Cecile, in like a refined and mature manner, which shows and indicates to us as readers that maybe she's growing up a little bit as this summer continues on. All right, so let's take a look at our um, teaching point. We always know we're looking out for um, character traits, relationships, point of view of the narrator, any possible themes that we notice as the text goes along, and any changes in the character, any changes in the plot, the setting, or the lessons. All right, so this chapter is called Civic Pride. We've been learning about civics since the first grade. There was always a field trip to the fire station on Henry Street. We watched the same film about the firemen, policemen, and mayor who kept our community safe and orderly. The film's narrator reminded every boy from Ellis Carter to the Jameses, the Anthonys, and every other pants wearer that they too could grow up to be guardians of our community. We girls were reminded that we could look forward to being teachers, nurses, wives, and mothers. Poets were never mentioned. At the center, we had a civics lesson. We were being taught our rights as citizens and how to protect those rights when dealing with the police. Sister Makumbu used the word policeman, while Crazy Kelvin, who filled in for Sister Pat, preferred to say the racist pig. He broke our rights down step by step as if there was no time to lose. Any given day, a police car could stop my sisters and me on our way from the Safeway market and search our bags of groceries. We had to be armed with our rights. As the lesson went on, it seemed like Crazy Kelvin wanted, all he wanted was to get us to the call the police the pigs. He started with Hirohito. My man, Hirohito, who knocked down your door and arrested your father? Hirohito's face fell to the table. He looked worse than when Sister Mukumbu asked him to revolve and spin around the sun. He picked at a flaky piece of skin on his thumb. Normally, I'd think, ooh, nasty boy, hi you, you're disgusting. Instead, I felt sorry for him with Crazy Kelvin poking at him? Hirohito answered, the police. Crazy Kelvin said, the who? Hirohito said, the Oakland police. That wasn't good enough for Crazy Kelvin, whom we had, whom we had to call Brother Kelvin in the classroom. He looked like a bony, big-beaked chicken going, the who? The who? It was like the time he shouted, black girl, and my sisters and me, while we shouted back, colored girl. It didn't take sharp eyes to see Sister Makumbu was annoyed with her helper. And as usual, she stepped in to put an end to it. Okay, here's a problem. Do you see how crazy Kelvin was treating the children at the center during the civics lesson? You know, like when he's like breaking down their rights as if there was no time to lose, shouting the who, the who at Hirohito. He really seems strong-minded about his mission, maybe even a little bit too um, forceful with how he's presenting it to the kids. It didn't take sharp eyes to see Sister Makumba was annoyed with her helper, and as usual, she stepped in to put an end to it. Crazy Kelvin was supposed to talk to us about our rights, not to stand there going the who, the who. Big, beep, big, big beaked Crazy Kelvin wasn't done. He said, the pigs broke down the door of a Vietnam War hero's house. The pigs handcuffed him without respect for his rights as a citizen. The racist pigs then separated Brother Woods from his family because he dared to speak the truth to the people. Hirohito tried to show no change in his face, but he was changing on the inside, where people change when they're sad or angry. He looked directly at me, then looked away. I felt like I was supposed to say something to him, but I didn't know what. Here's an interesting moment for Delphine and, and Hirohito. This part seems important. In this critical moment when Hirohito is being challenged and changing himself, he looks to Delphine. What could that signal? Could this signal that there's something developing between them, a connection of sorts? Let's keep that in mind as we read on. Sister Makumbu thanked Brother Calvin for being our guest speaker and showed him to the door. Fern tugged the hem of my top. I don't like him. Surely don't. I glanced Eunice Angton's way. I had just found out what she had meant when we were out by the water fountain, that Hirohito's father was in prison for speaking out to the people. Hirohito's father was what Sister Makumbu called a freedom fighter and a political prisoner. 
although now that I knew, I didn't find any satisfaction in having found out. Imagine, to have your father sitting down, eating dinner, or shining his shoes while watching TV, to have your front door blown off its hinges and the police rush in, to see your father in handcuffs led away. Hirohito didn't have to imagine, he knew. I had been scared once, and here this is a, a flashback for, for Delphine to share with us an experience she had that relates to this that happened to Hirohito's father. I had been scared once, truly scared for Papa. It happened two summers ago. Big Ma had gone back to Alabama ahead of us to visit family and take care of her house. We had packed up the Wildcat and had driven down to Alabama so my sisters and I could stay there for the summer. We had been driving all day, all night. Talk about being a long way from home. If we needed to stop, we found a gas station or a nice colored family to open their home to us. As we drove deeper south down dark highways and even darker back roads, I felt like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. I told myself, Delphine, we are no longer in Brooklyn. Papa had pulled the car off the road so that we could catch a few hours of sleep. I remember Vanetta snoring on one side of me, fern with Miss Patty Cake burrowing into my side, and somehow I managed to find myself snoring with my fathers and Papa. Then there had been a loud rap against the window. Balls of flashlight ghosts had flown all around the back and front seats, all over our faces. It had been a state policeman. Let's pause there a second. This phrase, balls of flashlight ghosts, had flown all around the back seats and front seats all over our faces. This seems to be like a figurative phrase and it kind of helps me as a reader to visualize this scene. You know, like I can see it in my mind, like all these, like, these flashlight balls kind of swirling back and forth over the dark car. But on a deeper level, this idea of ghosts following them all around, it's playing into one of the themes of this text, that idea that racism and racist ideals during this time period tend to haunt the girls and their family like ghosts. So I think the author used that phrase for a specific reason. And it's helpful for us to pause when phrases like that happen and truly think about what they mean in a deep way, not just on the surface. So those balls of flashlight ghosts had flown all around the back and front seats, all over our faces. It had been a state policeman. <gasps> this is a really important scene. Let's listen closely. Papa had rolled down his window and shown the state policeman his license and said that he was driving his girls down to see their grandma in Alabama. The state policeman hadn't offered directions. He hadn't called Papa, Mr. Gaither, sir, or citizen like the helpful police officer in our civic pride film. I heard what that state policeman called Papa. I heard it all right. I held on to Fern tight, afraid for Papa, afraid Papa might talk back or fight back. When we arrived at Big Ma's, I'd expected that Pa would have told Big Ma all about it. How we couldn't stop and pee anywhere we wanted to. How the state police had rapped on the window. What he'd called Papa. How Papa hadn't hauled back like Cassius Clay and socked that policeman's jaw into the next county. Papa could tell some stories. He speaks them so plain, you believe every word. I knew Papa would have entertained Big Ma. When Big Ma asked how'd that trip go, Pa had said, we made it down, sure enough. You know, Ma, same old, same old. And there's a picture there. Um, I think it's on the wrong slide there, but that we're going to, we, we've heard about little Bobby before, and that's going to come up in another chapter. So there's just a visual of him. All right, so let's, let's um, summarize here. Who was in this chapter and what new things did we learn? Well, so this chapter began with Crazy Calvin kind of really, you know, pounding it in about how the, the, this, the children should feel a certain way. And he pretty much embarrassed Hirohito by reminding him about his uh, father being taken away to jail. So we learned, that's important though, we learned why Hirohito's father is in jail for speaking up against, um, and, and speaking up for his rights. So that's one thing we learned. Um, and what seems important, what are we learning about the problem here? The flashback that Delphine just shared with us about how that encounter that they had in Alabama with her father and the police, that kind of shed some more light on the whole, you know, one of the larger problems of the story, the way that the, this, that Delphine's family is being treated during this time period. So that seems important for the problem. Um, also finding out what happened to Hirohito's dad, that seems like it's gonna be something that comes up again. So that's important for the problem. Um, and last, um, how does this chapter connect to what we read earlier? There were some parts there that they connected, especially when Delphine learned the secret about Hirohito's dad and how she had that moment with Eunice out by the fountain that connects to earlier. Um, and the way that the police have been treating her family 
and that encounter in Alabama connects to earlier when they were treated a certain way in the airport and when they, when they were treated a certain way um, when they came to Oakland. All these different ways that they've been treated in, um, in this time period connect across the text to one to the next as we build this idea of what was happening during the civil rights movement. So our question right now is what do Pa's actions or his inactions in this scene reveal about his character? What do Pa's actions or inactions in the scene reveal about him as a person? Use details from the text to support your response. All right, so we'll see you again for chapter 20 next time. Bye boys and girls.